Hello. Okay. Welcome everyone to the panel on sustainability in the cultural sector. Uh, my name is Catherine Turvey. I am the Program Officer for Culture with the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for hosting a culture panel at this national conference on the SDGs. Uh, I think it really shows a recognition that all of the sectors have a role to play in these big questions that we're all grappling with, um, and these big uh, th this big transition that is that is happening not just in the context of COVID nineteen but also in the broader context of climate change. Uh, so, the twenty thirty agenda um, from a cultural perspective, it was the first uh, global development agenda to acknowledge the role of culture in sustainable development. However, uh, there is no SDG for culture. So there is um, SDG 11, which uh, pertains to sustainable cities, which has target four related to the protection and safeguarding of the world's cultural and natural heritage. Um, but that doesn't necessarily go far enough to really show how culture can be a driver of sustainable development and contribute to most, if not all, of the SDGs in its own different ways. Um, so UNESCO, which is the only UN agency with a mandate in culture, has been working on uh, this question of really uh, drawing out how culture contributes to the 2030 agenda. And it's doing that through a series of culture conventions. So international standard setting instruments that are some of our panelists are going to talk about this afternoon. And those put together are, are a framework uh, to help member states foster, foster sustainable cultural sectors. And so when I'm talking about culture, I just wanna, wanted to be clear that I'm talking about culture in a really broad sense uh, going from intangible to built to natural uh, heritage and including the arts and cultural expressions. So we're talking about a really broad definition of culture here. So Canada is a party to a number of these conventions, but not all of them. Um, and uh, the within Canada, so the Canadian Commission for UNESCO, where I work, uh, we're responsible for, for promoting those values in Canada. So we started looking at this question actually not that long ago about how in Canada culture contributes to the implementation of the 2030 agenda. <clears throat> so we're really looking to draw out what, what does that mean? And so that is why we have brought together this today of our friends and partners um, and so I will just present them all quickly uh, and then we'll we'll get into their different presentations so we'll start with uh, Cody Grote who is Mohawk from Six Nations of the Grand River he is a PhD candidate at Wilfrid Laurier working on the federal commemoration of Indigenous heritage by the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada and he's currently the active acting president of the Indigenous Heritage Circle and works with CC UNESCO on the Canadian Committee for the Memory of the World. Uh, ensuite, on va passer en français uh, avec Ivana Otasevich, qui est la, la directrice adjointe de la chaire UNESCO sur la diversité des expressions culturelles à l'Université Laval. Euh, elle est titulaire d'un doctorat en droit international et chargée de cours à la Faculté de droit de l'Université de Laval. Ses domaines de recherche portent sur le statut juridique de la diversité culturelle, la dimension culturelle du développement durable la, et la protection de l'identité culturelle des migrants en droit international. Uh, then we will switch back to English uh, with Christophe Rivet, who is the president of ECOMOS Canada. ECOMOS is the International Council of Monuments and Sites, and it's an international NGO that works a lot with UNESCO to provide uh, technical uh, support for the World Heritage Convention. And uh, following Christophe's presentation, we'll hear from Claude Schreier, who is a composer by training and has been on the management team at the Canada Council for the Arts for 20 years. Uh, so, um, 
as you can see, we've got a broad uh, sort of cross section of the sector and um, hopefully we can provide some information that will be useful for everybody. For the questions, again, let me just remind you, you can use the Q&A section for that and I will be noting them down as the presenters do their thing. So without further ado, I will invite Cody to take the floor. Hello everyone, and I'm just going to ask if my colleagues on the panel can confirm that my mic is working fine before I get going. Okay, perfect. I have a thumbs up everyone. So thanks for joining our panel and I'd like to thank the organizers and Catherine for uh, allowing me to be here and for facilitating this and acknowledging our time. I'm just sort of going to dive in. So as Catherine said, my name is Cody Grote. I'm a PhD candidate in history at Wilfrid Laurier University. I'm the acting president of the Indigenous Heritage Circle, which is a national not-for-profit dedicated to the advancement of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis cultural heritage matters. And I also serve on the Canadian Commission for UNESCO Advisory Committee for the Memory of the World Program, which is a mouthful, and there's no easier way of getting that out. Um, admittedly, I was not too familiar with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development until just a few weeks ago. Um, but after being invited to speak at this conference, I soon began to realize that many of the guiding principles associated with Indigenous cultural heritage, which I study, could also be realized in the fulfillment of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and their associated 169 target goals. So I want to start by looking at cultural heritage and the 2030 agenda more broadly before I dig into specifically Indigenous content. And I want to build off some of my personal experiences in the past few weeks. So as we all know, the coronavirus pandemic has had a significant impact on the ability of heritage properties to attract the summer tourist income that often sustains their operations for the entire year. In response to this, the National Trust for Canada with the Indigenous Heritage Circle serving as a signatory called upon the federal government to provide stimulus heritage funding. In this recommendation to the federal government, it was noted that stimulus funding could be directed towards the restoration and reuse of heritage properties. When compared with a new build, this would reduce both greenhouse gas emissions and demolition waste, while also capitalizing on existing materials, energy, and carbon that were already invested into the initial construction of these heritage properties. While projects such as this are aligned with the ideas of sustainable development already, they're also based on a Western concept of cultural heritage that sometimes focuses on built infrastructure. Alternatively, Indigenous cultural heritage, which I study and work in, takes a more holistic approach that recognizes how Indigenous identity is intrinsically associated with the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples. Recognizing this, for example, the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada published a definition of what they referred to as Aboriginal cultural landscapes in 1999. And this states in part that, quote, an Aboriginal cultural landscape is a place valued by an Aboriginal group or groups because of their long and complex relationship with that land. It expresses their unity with the natural and spiritual environment. It embodies their traditional knowledge of spirits, places, land uses, and ecology. Now this definition is utilized in the commemoration of National Historic Sites of Canada, and it can also be used to better understand the commemoration of Indigenous cultural landscapes as World Heritage Sites by organizations like UNESCO. Um, World Heritage Indigenous Cultural Landscapes, which recognize the interrelationship between Indigenous peoples and their traditional territories, can provide valuable insight into how culture can intersect with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. A notable example of this interrelationship can be seen through Pimichuyanaki, which is a Canadian World Heritage Site recognized by UNESCO in 2018. The name of this site means the land that gives life in Anishinaabemowin, and it was recognized by UNESCO as being an exceptional testimony to the continuing Anishinaabe cultural tradition of Jiganawandamang, Gidigaman, or keeping the land. Now, this is a cultural framework that guides the relationship between the Anishinaabe and their traditional territories, instructing them to honor the creator's gifts through sustainable ways of life. This in itself aligns with Sustainable Development Goal 15, calling for the protection, restoration, and promotion 
of sustainable uses for terrestrial ecosystems and the sustainable management of forests. Another example demonstrating the interrelationship between indigenous culture and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development are the Yukon Ice Patches, which are listed on Canada's UNESCO World Heritage Tentative List. Similar to Pema Chuyanaki, the Yukon Ice Patches are recognized as an indigenous cultural landscape based on the symbiotic relationship between ice, animals, insects, and people for 7,500 years. Unlike Pema Chuyanaki, the Yukon Ice Patches are representative of a very real concern faced by many indigenous peoples. As mentioned, cultural practices and therefore elements of indigenous identity are intrinsically associated with sorry, traditional territories. If climate change continues to melt northern ice patches, many aspects of indigenous culture could be negatively impacted. This demonstrates how Sustainable Development Goal 13, calling on nations to take urgent action to combat climate change, is not just an environmental consideration, but also a cultural consideration. To conclude, I want to showcase one more intersection between Indigenous culture and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Target Goal 4.7 states in part that by 2030, all learners should require the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development. This can be read two ways in relation to Indigenous cultural landscapes, such as those that I have just discussed. First, it is vitally important that Indigenous peoples be provided with the means to pass on information about ecological stewardship to future generations. With this being said, it must also be recognized that many Indigenous cultural landscapes are associated with privileged community knowledge. Since last year, I have served on the Canadian Advisory Committee for the UNESCO Memory of the World Program, and the role of this program is to recognize the world's most significant documentary heritage collections and to assure that the information associated with these collections is publicly accessible. Even with this democratizing mandate, the Memory of the World program has acknowledged the principles of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which states that Indigenous peoples have a right to maintain, control, protect, and develop their traditional knowledge as this relates to flora, fauna, and other associated sciences. On this concluding note, it can be seen that culture, and specifically Indigenous culture, closely aligned with many of the aspects and concepts outlined in the 2030 Agenda. In order to meet the Sustainable Development Goals, it must be understood that collaborative approaches will be most successful when Indigenous ways of knowing and methodologies are understood in regards to the stewardship of their traditional territories. By respecting these practices, it may be possible to achieve the overarching objective of the 2030 Agenda itself, which is to ensure the lasting protection of the planet and its natural resources. Thank you, everyone. All right, thanks, Cody. Lots to think about there. Uh, on va maintenant passer à Ivana. Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Catherine. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, je souhaite avant tout uh, remercier les organisateurs pour la réalisation de cet événement uh, fort pertinent à l'heure actuelle et aussi uh, de me permettre de partager avec vous uh, quelques réflexions uh, sur l'impact de la protection et la promotion de la diversité culturelle, donc plus précisément de la diversité des expressions culturelles dans l'atteinte des objectifs de développement durable à l'horizon 2030. La Convention sur la protection et la promotion de la diversité des expressions culturelles, que je vais nommer la Convention de 2005, et dans le Canada était l'un des premiers pays à ratifier cet instrument juridique, donc, est également le dernier traité contraignant adopté par l'UNESCO dans le domaine de la culture en 2005 et qui engage pour la première fois les parties à s'employer à intégrer la culture dans les politiques de développement durable dans tous les secteurs et à tous les niveaux. Ainsi, cet instrument culturel demande à l'ensemble des acteurs de la communauté internationale à revoir le schéma traditionnel du concept de développement durable, initialement fondé euh, sur ces trois dimensions traditionnelles, à savoir donc l'économie, l'environnement et le volet social, afin euh, donc d'y intégrer la culture au sein de l'ensemble de leurs politiques et stratégies de développement. À titre de rappel, la Convention de 2005 reconnaît 
le droit souverain aux États d'adopter des politiques culturelles visant à protéger et promouvoir la diversité des expressions culturelles sur leur territoire et reconnaît la double nature, donc économique et culturelle, des biens, services et activités culturelles. Par exemple, on peut penser aux livres, à la musique ou encore à l'audiovisuel. La Convention de 2005 poursuit quatre objectifs principaux qui permettent de mesurer sa mise en œuvre par les parties d'un côté, mais aussi qui permet de contribuer à l'atteinte des ODD de l'agenda à l'horizon 2030. Alors à présent, je souhaite exposer et présenter brièvement ces objectifs. Le premier objectif est de soutenir des systèmes de gouvernance durable de la culture qui contribue par exemple à la réalisation de l'ODD 16 relatif à la paix, justice et institutions efficaces. La Convention de 2005 constitue une source d'inspiration et de légitimité lorsqu'il s'agit d'adopter des politiques culturelles et de les adapter aux évolutions de notre époque. On peut penser à l'adoption des mesures de protection et de promotion de la diversité des expressions culturelles dans l'environnement numérique, y compris en lien avec les enjeux culturels de l'intelligence artificielle. Le deuxième objectif est de parvenir à un échange équilibré des biens et services culturels et à accroître la mobilité des artistes et des professionnels de la culture dans le monde pour contribuer, entre autres, à la réalisation de l'objectif 8, qui est relatif au travail décent et à une croissance économique. La question de la mobilité des artistes et autres professionnels de la culture est primordiale pour que circulent des idées, des valeurs et des visions du monde hétérogène et aussi pour promouvoir des secteurs, des industries culturelles et créatives dynamiques. Le troisième objectif poursuivi donc, par la Convention de 2005 est de faire progresser l'intégration de la dimension culturelle dans les cadres de développement durable pour contribuer notamment à la réalisation de l'ODD 4 qui est relative donc à une éducation de qualité. À l'heure actuelle, la Convention de 2005 a un impact positif sur les politiques et programmes en faveur du développement culturellement durable. En 2018, sur les 111 parties à la Convention, donc États à la Convention, ayant adopté un plan, une stratégie de développement, 96 y ont fait référence à la dimension culturelle. Plus des deux tiers d'entre eux sont des pays du Sud qui considèrent surtout la dimension instrumentale de la culture, vue comme une source donc, de retombées économiques et sociales. Enfin, un dernier objectif poursuivi par euh, ce traité culturel, culturel euh, qui constitue aussi un principe fondamental de ce traité, euh, c'est la promotion euh, des droits de l'homme et la protection des libertés fondamentales d'expression, d'information et de communication euh, qui contribuent euh, à la réalisation de plusieurs objectifs de développement durable, euh, dont euh, le 11, euh, relatif aux villes et communautés durables. Il est à mentionner qu'au titre de la Convention de 2005, donc les partis, y compris le Canada, se sont notamment engagés à encourager les individus et les groupes. Euh, ici, on peut penser aux groupes vulnérables euh, comme les peuples autochtones, les migrants ou encore les membres euh, des minorités à créer, produire, diffuser, distribuer et aussi accéder à leurs propres expressions culturelles en tenant compte de leurs conditions et leurs besoins particuliers. Dans ce cadre, les partis devraient adopter des mesures à mettre en œuvre pour promouvoir spécifiquement les expressions culturelles des nouveaux arrivants, par exemple. Cette promotion et valorisation de leur culture pourrait favoriser considérablement leur intégration et le dialogue avec la communauté d'accueil. Et de ce fait, bien sûr, renforcer la cohésion sociale sur le territoire. De plus, de telles mesures pourraient favoriser l'atteinte de certains objectifs de développement durable à l'horizon 2030, mais aussi contribuer à la pleine réalisation de leurs droits de participer à la vie culturelle de leur communauté ou encore leur droit au respect de leur identité culturelle. À titre de conclusion, donc on peut affirmer qu'au cours des dernières années, 
on assiste à une reconnaissance de la dimension culturelle de développement durable sur la scène internationale, telle que reconnue et affirmée par la Convention de l'UNESCO de 2005. Cet instrument juridique constitue un outil précieux permettant aux États, mais aussi aux autres acteurs, tant sur la scène internationale que nationale, de s'appuyer sur les expressions culturelles, sur le secteur de la créativité et aussi sur les arts en vue d'atteindre les objectifs de développement durable à l'horizon 2030. Je vous remercie beaucoup pour votre attention. Merci Ivana. Donc, euh, beaucoup de, de détails sur des, des ODD très spécifiques et puis le travail global de la Convention de 2005. C'est très intéressant. Uh, so, we'll go to Christophe now, who is the president of Ecomos Canada. Bonjour, uh, good afternoon everyone. Thank you very much for this invitation. Um, I want to thank obviously our traditional partners, the uh, Canadian Commission for uh, having the, uh, the foresight of bringing together as such a, uh, a group of people to talk about uh, the, the significance of uh, culture in understanding what makes a community sustainable. And um, this is a great opportunity to address this at a national stage where Uh, we will collectively ask ourselves, what do we need to do next as we're facing the current situation to uh, return to a sense of well-being? So uh, I guess my, the, the point of my intervention today will be to, to highlight the, the traditional relationship between the idea of heritage and the idea of sustainability and um, try to illustrate it through some of the international commitments that have been made and that include Canada. So first off, um, ECOMOS, uh, to, to clarify our organization, we, uh, so we stand for, uh, ECOMOS stands for the International Council on Monuments and on Sites and it's an organization that was born in the 1960s. Uh, as, um, as the world was uh, grappling the idea of uh, uh, progress and its impact on communities. Uh, it all started with uh, cultural heritage, but in fact, natural heritage immediately was paired with, uh, with those concerns. Uh, it's noteworthy to, to talk about that origin because the idea of what makes a community sustainable is one that emerged uh, much further in time than we uh, wish to acknowledge it with um, that, that particular term, sustainability. And the history of our organization is tied to that evolution. <clears throat> As an organization, we um, acquired a specific responsibility with UNESCO in 1972 under the World Heritage Convention. We are one of three organizations that advises UNESCO and uh, our particular area of, uh, of expertise is cultural heritage. So within that context, our role and uh, the vision of the convention is to consider the relationship between people and place and how that relationship reflects a certain value of a human experience that needs to be maintained over time and over time being for eternity. And uh, this, uh, while, while there is that distinction between cultural and natural heritage in the World Heritage Convention, uh, that distinction in reality in our work is becoming less and less apparent. And as we are experiencing new ways of understanding that relationship between people and place through the World Heritage Convention, We are noting uh, um, the, the need to develop the kind of tools that understands much more closely that relationship between people, place, place being both the environmental setting and the human construct, and uh, people being as much the, the fundamental needs of, of a human community as its cultural expression. Um, ECOMOS has had that relationship with UNESCO through the World Heritage Convention, but it's been active over the years with a number of other uh, international tools. And one of the reasons why we are speaking today about um, sustainable uh, development goals and that cultural heritage has a presence in it is the result of the work of ECOMOS. Um, uh, after uh, the, um, the, the use of the Millennium Goals and uh, its, its, its application over time, there was a, a definite uh, 
need recognized for um, understanding whether and how uh, heritage in both its cultural and natural form had a, a role to play in understanding sustainability. So it is through the work of ECOMOS and IUCN and, uh, and uh, a couple of other players that uh, the, uh, the idea and the target of cultural and natural heritage made its way in, uh, in the SDGs. So what that accomplishment recognized, in fact, is that the definition of sustainability, which alludes to ideas of well-being, uh, to tap into that earlier term, um, uh, also are defined by this sense of connection to a continuity over time and to continuity over space, so natural heritage and cultural heritage. But we've also had uh, other international commitments that have framed and reinforced uh, that, that idea of connection. In uh, 2015, the UN um, Development um, uh, Program and the Habitat um, uh, Program um, convened the, the international community to sign a new urban agenda in Quito at Habitat 3. And that new urban agenda specifically outlines, while it's in, um, in, in a built environment, uh, it has a built environment focus, it specifically recognizes that heritage is not only a fundamental component of what an urban environment is, but in order to ensure its sustainability, policies have to be designed to pay attention to the nature, the function, and the evolution of that historic fabric. The third uh, area of intervention uh, that led to international commitments are the UNESCO recommendations themselves. So there is the uh, one that addresses the historic urban landscape and another one that addresses uh, culture and sustainability. And those two sets of recommendations that are extremely um, precise in articulating the relationship between culture, place, sustainability, really uh, uh, highlight the fact that in order to understand the needs of people, you need to understand their expressions in their surroundings, and you need to put in place the kind of policy and foresight that integrates those needs and the continuity of those needs over time. So to give you an example, the, um, the recommendations associated with uh, a report on culture, sustainability, and uh, cities uh, has three large, uh, three big recommendations. The first one stresses that people-centered cities are culture-centered spaces. So this idea that if, if we want to make those places uh, livable for people, uh, it, it is to equate it with a space that is uh, culturally rich. The second one is that a quality urban environment is shaped by culture. So in that respect, it, it also uh, reinforces that, that connection. And lastly, that sustainable cities need integrated policymaking that builds on culture. Those are uh, recommendations that are uh, uh, largely uh, inspirational for uh, those who uh, sign it. But for us, it means a, a consensus, an element of consensus around um, the importance of that connection between people, place, and culture. I'm going to finish by stressing a few uh, uh, key points of relationship with the other SDGs. When we talk about heritage, and I'm going to stress the idea of cultural heritage here, uh, this idea is related to uh, environmental considerations, economic considerations, as well as rights considerations. When we talk about uh, making a decision on whether a, a particular uh, place or building needs to be recognized by an authority uh, for it being special and needs then uh, to, uh, to be the focus of uh, collective policies for its long-term preservation, we collectively acknowledge that there is a, a right for the community that's associated with that heritage to express itself and to, uh, to, uh, to exist as a, as a collective interest. When we say that we want to conserve a particular building and we wish to not demolish it and that we wish to preserve it according to techniques that reflect the traditional building uh, methods, the traditional materials, we are talking about an approach that is sensitive to environmental considerations because we are focusing on 
reducing waste. We are focusing on traditional skills. We are focusing on traditional materials. That's not to say that there's no flexibility to adapt with contemporary materials uh, to improve energy efficiency, for example. But it does mean that our attention to, uh, to our built environment and our relationship with our built environment is defined by that sensitivity to, uh, to also environmental conditions. And lastly, uh, the economic dimension. Uh, it is not to be assumed that everyone has uh, an equal access to uh, housing, uh, for example. It is also not to be assumed that um, uh, places that are open to tourism are, uh, historic places open to tourism are only economically viable because of tourism. So my point in highlighting those two examples uh, of economic dimensions of heritage is to say that we have an existing built fabric that has been transmitted over generations, that has withstood the test of time, and that can find a role in our current needs. Uh, whether it is for affordable housing or it is for other uses in the community. So to conclude, uh, I want to reinforce uh, that idea that the, the, the concept of heritage is one that is intimately tied to, to sustainability uh, uh, along the lines of um, this uh, sensitivity to environmental matters, economic matters, and rights matters. And that when we talk about the integration of culture, cultural heritage with sustainability, we are talking about a continuum of logic in, in those ideas. Merci. Uh, thank you, Christophe. And we will move right along to Claude. And I'm just noting that the time is 2.33. So we'll, after Claude's presentation, we'll move on to the, to the Q&A portion. And for anyone, watching that has questions, uh, now's the time to please enter them into the Q&A section. Cool. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I will, uh, I imagine some of you are having a bit of Zoom fatigue, so I'll try to, uh, to be brief. Um, I want to acknowledge that I am here in Ottawa on the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe uh, Algonquin Nation and want to pay my respects. And I'll do my presentation in English, but s'il y a des questions en français, me fera plaisir après. So my colleagues have said uh, many important things about culture, and I'm going to focus a bit more on the arts. So I work for Canada Council of the Arts, which was founded 1957 with the Canadian Commission for UNESCO jointly. The Commission works uh, autonomously, or at least in parallel with the Council, but there's really good synergies these days between the Council and UNESCO, and that's really important. What I want to say is that about a year ago, I was invited to a summit at the Banff Centre that the National Arts Centre organized on theatre and climate change. And that was a really important moment because we went really deep and tried to understand all of the issues, the psychological, the uh, activism, the, the theoretical aspects of, of art and climate change. And I see that happening across around the world, but more and more in Canada. So there's growing momentum, um, but there are dots that are not being connected. And so Catherine and I and others have been working on and trying to connect those dots and have the arts and cultural sector work together um, to, to work and on this global issue of, of climate change. So that's, that's good news. And at that Banff summit, I met a woman named Alison Tickell, who runs a, an organization in the UK called Julie's Bicycle, who do really good work in measuring uh, the carbon footprints and the impact of arts organizations in, in Europe, in the UK. And, and that's a model, I think, uh, in terms of um, SDGs, is, is being able to actually measure what you're doing and then have that measurement influence the work, the artistic work, so that if you know where you're at and what you're doing, you can uh, look more closely at change. Very influential. And a month later, I attended the uh, AGM of uh, CC UNESCO in Ottawa, and um, Ivana and Christopher were there. <laughs> and then people were saying, well, culture isn't, doesn't have its own SDG, it's a, it's a through line. And, and I thought that was really interesting. And so Catherine and I pulled together a, a round table in October and, and uh, a number of, 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 of experts were there. And, and so we're working our way through uh, in the arts sector to, to better understand SDGs because it doesn't necessarily come naturally to think that the arts are, are a part of that, but of course they are. Of course they are and they have to be and they have to be increasingly so. Uh, 
So um, Catherine and I were invited uh, to a gathering of McConnell Foundation and, and Tamarack Institute in Waterloo, where we met Julie Wright, who's uh, one of the organizers today. And then we said, we have to do more um, contact um, with the, within the arts community and connection with, um, with the climate change movement and make sure that arts and culture, which is essentially, it's essential in the sense that we know that climate change is uh, a cultural issue, then how does then culture change? Um, it needs the stories, it needs all the voices of artists, the work, uh, the, the history of artistic intervention and activism needs to be applied to this really um, very, very large issue. So I wanted to just tell you a little bit more about what the Canada Council is doing. Um, on January 15th, our CEO and director, Simon Po, wrote a blog, which I encourage you to read. It, it's very short, it's called Art and Climate Change. And I'll just read a bit of it and you'll see uh, where we're at uh, in relation to climate change. We are currently developing our strategic plan for 2021 and we're looking to take a solid and consistent position on the issue of climate change. And our position will include an authentic, authentic Indigenous perspective and an international and inclusive point of view. In addition to focusing on environmental innovative approaches to production and dissemination, the Council will continue to support creation that addresses climate issues in all dimensions artists choose to explore. The Council will also continue to demonstrate exemplary practices in the way it manages and reduces its own ecological footprint. So that's basically walking your own talk as an institution. We need to, to do that. We are doing that. And now uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, the, the dynamic has changed, but the work still needs to be done to um, address the issue of climate change. But now maybe there's an opportunity to fold it into a, a larger process of rethinking a lot of things that maybe weren't working, weren't working in the past anyway, and uh, move forward with, with arts and culture really uh, central uh, to the way that we think and we work. So according to my time, my clock, I, uh, I'm, my time is over. So I'll just wrap up by saying that um, I think uh, there's an opportunity in this panel and going forward to, to really think, um, think culture and to, uh, to have um, those, those dots that aren't connected better connected. So I'll pass it back to Catherine and see what kind of questions people have and we can go a bit further in the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Claude, and uh, thank you for sharing that bit of context as well about our work together on this file over the last uh, year or so. And um, yeah, that's been um, really, I think that the driving force of this work has been our uh, climate anxiety coming together and really making us ask ourselves, what can we do from where we're sitting? Um, so, um, Claude also mentioned a roundtable that we hosted uh, back in the fall uh, when we were all able to meet together. Uh, and I can share some information for those who are interested uh, because we posted a blog on the CC UNESCO website. So if anyone's curious about what were the outcomes of that meeting, um, you can find it all in written form. Um, but really, we did, as Claude mentioned, we, we really found that there's, there's a sort of gap in the knowledge and uh, there's a need to sort of fill in the gaps as to how our sector contributes to fighting climate change specifically, but also uh, contributing to the 2030 agenda. Um, so before, we have one question on the Q&A, but before I address that one, first of all, I just wanted to mention uh, that yesterday, um, when I was listening in on the first uh, panel, I was really struck by something that Catherine Potvin said um, about uh, the sort of post-COVID recovery and emergency funding should go into what she called resilience thinking. And when I heard that, it really struck me <coughs> that that is something that uh, the culture sector is, is, is really well positioned to do. So I just wanted to hear from the panelists if they had any thoughts um, on the idea of resi resilience thinking and maybe a sort of pitch for, uh, for the culture sector at large to really get involved in that. So maybe Christophe or Ivana. Sure, I'll, uh, I'll offer a few thoughts because in fact, it's been uh, quite top of mind for uh, 
my organization and other national organizations in heritage uh, that uh, the the idea of appreciating one's immediate surroundings and the idea of what will be required to uh, to stimulate the economy seem to be on a collision course. And what I mean by that is that there is a sense that um, the um, as, as perhaps I'll leave it as a, at, a, at a fairly personal experience that perhaps everyone can relate to or many of us, uh, these days we're confined to our homes and our space extends a few hundred meters around our homes as we're walking in our neighborhoods, recognizing uh, some of the stores that we've always cared about and realizing that they're shut. Um, that uh, the main streets that we love that uh, speak to where we come from in a small town or a big city neighborhood uh, seem to be dead of life. And it is that dimension that concerns us because for us, that's what we refer to as a main street. And those main streets are the heart and soul of communities. The reason why we are concerned about the potential collision course is that as governments will be looking to stimulate the economy through infrastructure building. It is important from our perspective that if we are to be consistent with our national commitments as, as Canada has committed to the SDGs and to the new urban agenda and to the UNESCO recommendations, if we are to be consistent with those recommendations, it strikes us as obvious that one of the first areas of investments for infrastructure and strengthening communities should be in that seemingly more modest infrastructure, but it is our main streets. And uh, it would be our existing fabric. That's where uh, people's hearts are. This is where some of these elements of identity are anchored, but it's also what, what makes uh, the community alive and thriving. And it is those, those, uh, those uh, areas of, of neighborhoods and cities that uh, offer the opportunity for anyone from any walk of life to uh, start a business, uh, to meet friends, and uh, so on. So from our perspective, um, I guess uh, we, we are actively thinking about the impact of, of this uh, pandemic and the policies in place and the risk that that represents of, of, uh, of uh, missing out on that bigger idea of sustainability, which includes these these elements of culture in, in our neighborhoods and uh, communities. Thanks, Christophe, Ivana. Euh, oui, merci. Euh, en fait, j'aimerais aussi souligner, comme euh, Christophe vient de le dire, euh, donc la crise sanitaire qu'on est en train de vivre. Euh, donc présentement, on avait vu que euh, on s'est tous euh, finalement euh, tournés euh, vers euh, les euh, produits audiovisuels, donc vers, vers les films, vers la musique, euh, vers le livre. Et donc, euh, on a vu que ce sont vraiment donc, ces expressions euh, culturelles-là euh, qui nous aident euh, finalement à passer euh, à travers euh, ces périodes difficiles et donc qui nous aident aussi à être euh, plus résilients euh, avec la situation. Euh, je souhaite aussi souligner que, euh, L'UNESCO, euh, dans ce sens, donc, a lancé en fait, un mouvement mondial qui s'appelle Résiliart. Vous pouvez trouver donc, toutes les informations nécessaires sur le site de l'UNESCO euh, dans le domaine de la culture. Et donc, c'est finalement euh, euh, tous ces, ces impacts aussi que la crise sanitaire euh, euh, donc, provoque euh, à l'égard euh, du secteur créatif et également culturel. Euh, donc, la, la pandémie a un impact sur toute la chaîne donc, euh, de la valeur créative, la création, la production, la distribution et l'accès. Et donc, euh, il faut considérablement voir comment redynamiser euh, le secteur culturel et créatif après euh, donc, cette crise sanitaire et aussi voir comment euh, finalement renforcer les statuts euh, des professionnels de la culture et des artistes qui se sont vus euh, leurs conditions encore plus s'affaiblir aujourd'hui euh, avec donc la crise sanitaire. Euh, donc on voit justement ce besoin euh, euh, pour que les États, les gouvernements euh, donc prennent des mesures, surtout de soutien et de support à l'égard donc de l'ensemble du secteur culturel euh, et créatif. <rire> 
Merci, Ivana, uh, and thank you for um, informing everyone about UNESCO's Résiliar movement. Um, as Ivana said, we're, I believe we're losing the interpretation, but uh, UNESCO has launched a series of online virtual debates that have been really interesting, um, really about this question of um, how culture hel is helping us through this difficult moment, but also how we can relaunch culture when this is all over uh, and really support these systems which have shown to be in this crisis um, uh, uh, fragile. Um, so um, we have lost the interpretation, but I would like for the panelists to maybe address the question that's been brought up on the Q&A. Um, so the question is about the fact that Canada is the most multicultural country in the world um, and uh, asking how do we integrate that position in the world that Canada has to teach about tolerance and embracing of all traditions and cultures to promote peace. So I guess the question is really asking about how do we uh, as a very multicultural uh, country um, how do we uh, embrace that for in the interest of, of the SDGs? And I see that Cody has uh, something to say about that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly turn this around and look at this idea of multiculturalism and being a multicultural country, but talking about how that could have great impacts in Canada. Um, and I want to start by acknowledging that when it comes to Indigenous communities, not only do we have uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, but within those we have hundreds of nations, uh, very distinct nations of distinct cultural practices. And I mean, it's my belief looking through a lot of this, uh, these presentations and hearing what was said today in SDGs, I think it's really uh, important and interesting to note that um, really providing the resources to help uh, traditional practices, traditional ecological practices thrive, for instance, can really help address some of the inequalities that are facing Indigenous peoples, for example, in Canada today. You think that um, you know there's health inequalities, there's food inequalities in Canada that are still existing, and food inequalities can impact Indigenous peoples. And really helping to foster again these uh, ecological practices that Indigenous people have used since time immemorial in their traditional territories that can really help to address the inequalities that are in place in society today. So I know that's kind of changing the question from the rest of the world, but I still think it builds on how multiculturalism can help with issues of inequalities, for example. Claude? That's oh, a very interesting question. From arts funding point of view, um, we created a program uh, by and for Indigenous artists called Creating, Knowing and Sharing at Canada Council. And that's made a big difference, um, as Cody has said, to have um, both traditional and contemporary voices heard and um, a, a, a more um, powerful uh, set of programs and support for the community, for the, the, the large um, Indigenous communities in Canada. And the other thing that we do at the Council is support a very wide range of artistic practice and, and forms of cultural expression, which also I think feeds into um, to, to, to the question. But uh, from, an, from an arts point of view, that we, we try to have as much a diversity of expression as possible. Great. I think uh, Christophe has something to say. Thank you. I was just going to add to, to this that from, from a cultural heritage perspective, uh, um, I, I, I wanted to point the, the value of the World Heritage Convention in achieving the goal that was asked in this particular question. That uh, and this is where uh, Canadians are particularly well suited in in aspiring to those goals of the World Heritage Convention because it is um, our own aspiration of how we want to build our our society, one that celebrates and respects cultural diversity, and one of the uh, from from the standpoint of our professional experience, one of the more uh, obvious ways to uh, demonstrate that commitment to cultural diversity and respect for. Uh, multicultural approaches to uh, to life is to protect uh, the physical evidence of the presence of those uh, the different uh, communities and the different cultures. Uh, we have seen through uh, even recent history, uh, including on directly on World Heritage sites, uh, 
that they become targets uh, if uh, there is a conflict between cultural groups. Uh, one uh, site becomes the target of, of another cultural group. So there is a deliberate uh, uh, attempt at erasing the physical evidence of that presence. And those are real signs of, uh, of attention needed to, uh, to, um, to uh, aspire to respect cultural diversity. So to, to I guess, to, to conclude on that question is, uh, uh, to aspire to uh, export tolerance uh, is is to also recognize at home uh, those uh, technical those uh, physical uh, expressions of cultural diversity and and perhaps uh, consider uh, the 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 collective actions that we need to take to make sure that those sites those places are respected can thrive and can become uh, living expressions of of these um, uh, different cultures. Great, I hope that answered uh, the question. In any case, I thought it was uh, very interesting. So um, we're running up to the top of the hour. So I think we can uh, cl close it on that. Uh, just wanted to note a couple of things before we, before we sign off. Uh, really that this work is, is uh, I feel that it's just beginning. Uh, and that uh, the Canadian Commission for UNESCO is uh, currently working on launching a working group on this question and hopefully uh, be able to generate much more dialogue, bring in more people to the conversation and maybe eventually create some resources for the sector. So this is, uh, this is the beginning of a conversation for us. Uh, and I thank all of the participants and all of the panelists for being part of it. Um, and if anyone has any questions about that, please feel free to uh, contact me uh, and to follow the commission on social media. Um, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, follow up. So thank you to everybody and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. <laughs>